Howdy. Now, come on now, I'm from Texas. Howdy. All right. I'm glad the pastor introduced my beautiful bride over there, Brenda Gail Smith from Nieder Weber from Nederland, Texas. How about that? Huh? I, I tell people that. I say, she's, I grew up in Nederland. They say, she's a bulldog. I said, you know her. Yeah, yeah. And, and what's the old, the old saying that behind every successful man is a surprise mother-in-law? Oh, no, that's, that's not the one. Yeah. Well, <laughs> Well, thank you, Pastor, for inviting us, and uh, thank you all for being here. It's an absolute blessing to see the children's ministry uh, in here at the same time. Family Day, what a great day for Family Day. How many of y'all think Family Day is a great day? You bet, you bet. So I'm gonna give you a little of my background so you can kind of tell what your member of Congress uh, kind of grew up doing and how he came to know Jesus Christ personally on July 2nd. 1973. Now, Randy Weber was born the first time on July 2nd, 1953, okay? And you know, in the third chapter of the Gospel of John, Nicodemus comes to Jesus by night, and he says, what must a man do to be born again? And Jesus, to see the kingdom of God, and Jesus said, unless a man is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And Nicodemus says, can I enter my mother's womb a second time? And they have that conversation. Well, for Randy Weber, I was born again on my regular birthday. I was born the first, hey, give the Lord a hand, you bet, you bet. And I'll tell you more about that. So the pastor's right, on November the 6th, Brenda Gale and I will have been married 48 years. She hasn't killed me yet and I can prove that. So, so give her a hand. Um, our plan was to, to wait five years to have children, and uh, she was gonna get a teaching degree, and I was gonna go to law school. Now, some of y'all can start doing some math now. We got married November the 6th, 1976, and on October the 31st, 1977, 11 months, three, I hear y'all here, 11 months, three weeks, and one day, Miss Kristen Nicole was born. And so uh, I said, people said, don't you know how that happened? I said, well, I think I had something to do with it. You know, so I think I know how it happened. So we had, God had a plan. I didn't get to go to law school. I had to keep working. And I started my business uh, working in my parents' RB dealership. And I didn't want to do that. I had a degree in business. Didn't want to do that for a long time. Well, we had two boys after that. So we got three kids. And as the pastor said, eight grandkids and one great-granddaughter. Now, y'all help me here. I like to label things. Her name is Quinn, Q-U-I-N, N, and she's what, Brenda, almost 10 months now, give or take? And uh, her last name is Dorval, D-O-R-V-A-L, okay? So we had three kids, like I told you. Um, we had all Ks, Kristen, Keith, and Kyle. Somebody said, well, Randy, well, if you'd had a fourth, what would you have named it? I said, Caboose. <laughs> just, just wasn't gonna be no Caboose. So now we, they all had K's and we gave them nicknames. Uh, and so now comes along Quinn Dorval and she is the cutest thing in the world. We just think grandkids are wonderful, you know. Uh, grandkids are, y'all got y'all family. The parents know grandkids are the rewards you get for not killing your own kids, you know. <laughs> but um, she comes along Quinn Dorval and so I've nicknamed her, see what y'all think. Her Quinn, first initial Q, Dorval, first initial, D. She's a cutie. See there, Brenda, I told you they'd like that. She's a cutie. She's the sweetest little cutie. So we'll see if it sticks. Well, uh, I, didn't, I ran, started my air conditioning business from scratch. Went back to Alvin Junior College where I met this young thing 50 years ago, this November. Uh, saw her in the, in the uh, I guess, the cafeteria. Asked her out, took her out one time. She said, that guy's... Think, he's so corny, thinks he's so funny. She told her best friend, I'm not going out with him when he calls. Ladies, you know what the problem was? I knew that was her attitude. I didn't call her. She told her best friend, he didn't call me back. What's wrong with this guy? I got to get a timer on because I think I told the pastor I wouldn't go over two hours. <laughs> so, and so I didn't call her. So it goes to two weeks. Roy, I didn't call her two weeks. And uh, she told Martha, he didn't call me for a second week. What's, what's wrong with this guy? Who is this guy? It went to three weeks, ladies. Guess what happened? 
She called me. See, they know that. See, we've been together ever since. <laughs> yeah, give her a hand. <laughs> Um, I watched Ronald Reagan on TV in 83, and, and full, and full uh, disclosure, I voted for Jimmy Carter. My first presidential election, right? I know, I voted for Jimmy Carter because uh, he was an unavowed, unashamed, he was an avowed, unashamed uh, of his Christianity. And so I voted for Jimmy Carter. Well, Reagan won that 80 election, you know. So I watched him for three years. And ladies and gentlemen, kids, Ronald Reagan believed in America. He believed in American exceptionalism. He believed in freedom. He believed in smaller government, lower taxes, and he believed that America was destined for greatness. Now, when I say he believed in individual freedom, here's the thing, he also believed in individual responsibilities. Such, so many times today, people want that freedom, but guess what? They don't want the responsibility that goes with it. Can I get a witness? Yes, Come on, I gotta get y'all going. We're gonna pass the hat again. Come on. So. Anyway, I became a precinct chair, a lot of y'all know what that is, in Brazoria County, uh, and was a precinct chair and election clerk and finally election judge for about 16 years. I held, I held elections. My air conditioning company was running itself, God had blessed it. I held elections and I could be at the, on the two weeks of early voting. I was the election judge, which means I selected the, pre, the election clerks. We got there at six to open at seven and had everything lined up. So. Then they got me to run for Pearland City Council in 1990, and I, I still was a precinct chair then. I was there six years, and uh, then I ran for county, and I spent running in 1990 for city council. I think it cost me like $500. We did all the different stuff ourselves by hand. And then I ran for uh, county commissioner in 1996, and I spent $7,000 and lost. $7,000 of my own money. I said, well, I ran against the state rep. He was a lot higher office than me. Maybe that was a bit ambitious. So in 98, I ran for a drainage district commissioner, spent $7,800 and lost. And I said, well, darn, man, they just don't want me around, do they? Well, our state rep died in office and, um, in, 19, in 2006. So people said, Randy, you got to run for state rep. So <laughs> I said, maybe that's what I, God has me intended to do. So I ran for state rep in 2006. I spent, we, I didn't miss that, Brenda, we spent $70,000 and lost. You're beginning to see a pattern here. Now you know why I'm gonna pass the bucket, by the way. <laughs> so the guy that beat me couldn't be there uh, but one term, and so the, they called me to run again. I said, oh, I can't keep doing this. My bride's gonna kill me. We're spending so much money. Well, they said, what if we get behind you and we raise the money? So we prayed about it, talked about it, went back and forth on it and said, okay, if you all raise the money, we'll run. Well, I won that, that second go around 2008. Yeah, you bet. I got to serve with Joe Desotel. I got to serve with Alan Ritter. Some of y'all probably know them. Okay, great people from over here. Craig Island was from Galveston. We did a lot of work on coastal issues. So I was there four years and then Ron Paul announced he was retiring and people started calling me and saying, <laughs> started calling the chief, my chief of staff up in Austin and saying, Randy needs to run for Congress, replace Ron Paul. She called me and says, people are calling and saying, you need to run for, and I said, Carl, for Congress? Do I look stupid? Don't answer that, don't answer that. <laughs> and true story, true fact, I said, some of y'all remember George H.W. Bush, no, read my lips, judge, no new taxes, right? So I said to Cara, Cara, read my lips. I am not running for Congress. Well, how'd that work out, right? So Brent and I went back and forth and back and forth. We decided maybe this is God's plan for us. So we did. And it is from, with those experiences in light of being your member of Congress that I realize, people, we're losing America. If we don't get back on track, we are gonna lose this country that God has given us. I believe we were founded on Christian Judeo principles and it was God ordained. Can I get a witness? You bet, you bet. So um, there's so much that we have to do. And, and when I say that people, Reagan knew that, you know, everybody could have freedom, but he also wanted them to have responsibility, a personal responsibility for being a part of the greatest nation 
the greatest experiment in self-governance that the world has ever known. And so with that in mind, I watch what's happening. And my beautiful bride taught fourth grade 27 years. Any fourth graders in here? Yeah, there's one in the back, yeah. She's, uh, she looks a little haggard, but she's in the back, fourth grade teacher. But uh, so she gets this, and, and when I was in the state house, I was on the pub ed committee for four years. So I, eat, I ate, drank, breathed, slept public education. We are not teaching, I say we, most of us Christians, of course, our families, especially with family day, we understand what's at stake, don't we? We get this, right? We get it, you bet. Y'all are here, you get it. But we're not teaching kids about respect for authority. We're not teaching kids about what our country was founded on. We're not teaching kids respect for private property rights. They don't respect teachers. They don't respect police officers, our great police officers. Give them a hand. Can we give them a hand? <clears throat> what aggravates me, I can be in a grocery store, some child is acting up, the mother shakes and says, you better straighten up. There's a police officer over there. He's going to get you. And I'm like, oh, man, please don't tell that child that. Teach them to respect and honor and want to, you know, have police officers in positions of authority. Thank you. I kind of thought so myself. <laughs> um, so the other thing that we're not teaching our kids, is, this is something I've, I've done for a while, uh, is called what I call, my, it's my speech I wrote, it's called The Latest and the Greatest. It's not about videos, it's not about boxing or football, nothing like that. The Latest and the Greatest. Are we teaching our, the next generation, the latest generation coming up? Are we teaching them about the greatest generation that ever was? Those vets among us. By the way, how many vets do we have? Raise your hand for us, please. Let's give them a hand. Can we give them a hand? Get, let's, get, let's stand up and honor them. Can we do that? You betcha. You bet you. Thank y'all, thank y'all, thank y'all. We're not teaching the latest generation. And Brenda would see it in class. Kids didn't have respect for each other, for their parents. Have you ever seen a child strike its parent? Boy, that just gets all over me. What does the scripture say? Spare the rod, spoil the child. That's right. And I knew that, man. I had that growing up. I, my my family didn't go to church. Well, we went to church twice a year, whether we needed it or not. What, what was it? Christmas and Easter, you betcha. Y'all went, went to that part of our same family, I think, yeah. But we're not teaching kids about the latest generation, the greatest generation. And here's what I tell people. The greatest generation, my dad was one of them. Uh, he served in the Army over in the Philippines, World War II. He went, he back, some of y'all, if you're as old as I am, you know that the Japanese ran General Douglas MacArthur out of the Philippines in World War II. And because and when he when they did, he made a promise. I will return. My dad marched back in through Corregidor with General Douglas MacArthur when he when he returned. My dad went over to the Philippines. We lost my he was one of the late, the greatest generation. We lost my dad on Flag Day, June fourteenth, twenty seventeen, seven years ago. We're not teaching our kids about the greatest generation. You want the, here's what they did. The greatest generation they went out in World and some of you all know this, in World War II, my gosh, these young people were lying about their age to be able to go to fight for this country. They'd be 15, 16, 17, because they, want, they recognized evil and wickedness and what was at stake. And the greatest generation went out and fought the vilest enemy the world had ever known and defeated that enemy so that the world could be a safe place. And then they simply came back home. Not all of them, many of them paid that ultimate price, the, what Lincoln called the last full measure of devotion at Gettysburg, in his Gettysburg Address. Not all of them came back, they, they were injured. Some were injured and maimed forever. And, Many of them buried overseas. They paid the last full measure of devotion. But they, the, the greatest generation came back to this, to this country and they simply built the greatest country the world had ever seen. They didn't ask for nothing in return. 
They knew that freedom was at stake. They felt like it was their God-honoring duty to protect this country. Are we teaching the latest generation about the greatest generation? I'm afraid we're falling down on the job, a family, because it's important that we keep this country. Y'all are watching what's going on. It's important that we keep this country. Uh, well, let's see, I'm 10 minutes into it, Pastor, and I've got to, my, I got to get to my notes now. So, oh, no, no, it's, it's all good. <clears throat> well, look, I said I was born the first time, July 2nd, 1953, uh, in, I was in Houston, Texas, and uh, got into high school, and, you know, Paul admonishes in 1 Corinthians that a bad company ruins uh, mor good morals. So I, even though my family didn't go to church, I mean, I was taught respect. Man, I didn't dare bad, bad talk. When I was five years old, my mother came out inside, in kindergarten. Mom came out and said, Randy Weber, stop playing. Get inside, get cleaned up for kindergarten. And she disappeared back into the house. Uh, two or three, four minutes later, she came back out. And she said, Randy Weber, stop playing. Get inside, get cleaned up. And I put my little five-year-old hand on my hip. And I said, and just who do you think's going to... And do you know by the time I got to m I knew who was going to make me. <laughs> she took me inside and she blistered my, my bottom. And I said, thank you, Mom. We buried her last week at the age of 94. And I got to eulogize her and say, thanks, Mom, for doing that. So I ran around high school and, and uh, once I got involved in drugs. I did. I got involved in marijuana, LSD, and all those kinds of things. And believe it or not, I started selling marijuana and LSD out of an apartment, out of a rent house in an apartment. And uh, a friend of mine named Jeff Wilson uh, used to come by and buy weed from us, drugs. And um, he came by, he hadn't seen him in a while, and he came by and he said, Randy, I got something I want you to try. And like some crazy druggie, I said, what is it? You know, he said, I want you to go to church with me. I said, Jeff Wilson, you have lost your mind. I'm not going to church with you. Well, he persisted. He finally got me to go to the Church of the Redeemer, which was the Spirit-Filled Episcopal Church, Telephone Road in Polk in Houston, Texas. Those people were on fire for the Lord. They were opening up their houses to unwed mothers, people on drugs, ex-alcoholics, whatever it might be. Just letting them coming in, let them use their, didn't charge them rent provide them with meals, a car back and forth to work. They, they were actually the Acts 2 church. Where, and how many of y'all know that there, there's a car in the, in the Bible? Y'all know there's one car mentioned in the Bible in Acts. It says the disciples were all in one accord. That's a Honda. I, I, it's, a, it's a Honda, sure, sure. <laughs> well, these people were all in one accord. They were taking care of the, of the, of the down the, on their luck whether it was marriage problems, drug problems, whatever it might be. And I watched them and I realized they, they weren't playing like regular church goers. They weren't playing games. They were the real deal. So I decided I was going to clean up my act. I was working in a construction company. So I quit smoking, drinking, cussing, uh, t telling bad jokes. My kids say, no, Dad, you still tell some pretty bad jokes. I said, I'm not talking about those kind. I'm talking about dirty jokes. How many of y'all know dad jokes? Come on. Do y'all know how to tell when your kid starts telling a dad joke? Anybody? It, it'll be apparent. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> See what my kids think? I tell some pretty bad jokes. I quit smoking recent cussing and telling really bad jokes for about three or four months. And then on July 2nd, 1973, my 20th birthday, the guys at the construction company were rattled me. You need to go have a drink with us. You need to go back out. Let's, let's do all this stuff. Well, I started right back to it. Pack of cigarettes, smoking, drinking, cussing. Things I hadn't done in four months. I get home. My mom's making me birthday dinner. She gives me a gift of a living Bible. I didn't even own a Bible. I didn't even own a Bible. So I take this living Bible, and I'm walking down um, the hallway, and I hear a voice say, Randy, read Ephesians 5. Well, I didn't know where Ephesians was in the Bible. I didn't know if it was in the Old Testament or the New Testament. I had to go to the table of contents. And guess what? It's in the New Testament. I didn't know if it had uh, five chapters. Guess what? Anybody? 
It's got six, okay? I turned there in my own bedroom and, and for the first time in my life read these Ephesians 5, verse 4. Dirty stories, foul talk, coarse jokes. These are not for you. Instead, remind each other of God's goodness and be thankful. You can be sure of this. The kingdom of Christ and of God will never belong to anyone who is impure or greedy, or a greedy person is really an idol worshiper. He loves and worships the good things of this life more than God. Don't be fooled by those who try to excuse these sins, for the terrible wrath of God is upon all who do them. Don't even associate with these people, verse 7 says. For though once your heart was full of darkness, it is now full of light from the Lord, and your behavior should show it. Because of this light within you, you should only do what is good and right and true. Learn as you go along what please the Lord, and I'll just skip down. And it comes down to the very last verse in verse 14. He says, that is why God says in the scriptures, awake, O sleeper, and rise up from the dead, and Christ shall give you light. And I give the Lord a hand, please. <clears throat> And I knelt down at my, between the twin beds in my bedroom and I cried my eyes out and said, Lord, please come into my heart and be my personal Savior. And I walked out of that room. I left my Bible there and I walked back where my mom was making me a birthday dinner. And the phone rang in the kitchen. House was built in 72. Can anybody say orange for Mike countertops? <laughs> How about a rotary phone, huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm showing my age. The phone rang. And it was Jeff from the Episcopal Church. Randy, I can't tell you how glad I am you just got saved. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I'm like, whoa, God put a stamp on my life that I would never doubt or never, ever uh, be afraid of my relationship with Jesus Christ. So... I can't tell you how glad I am to be here. I want to tell you that we need to exalt the Lord. We need members of Congress, members in the state legislature, members in the city, many of judges. We've got fine judges here. And people give, so let's give them a hand. We want Christians in office. Christians in office. <clears throat> so I'll end with one last thought. <clears throat> end with one last thought. The world is on fire. And when the world... Uh, has a calamity. It can be an earthquake, it can be a fire, it can be whatever it is, a tsunami, pestilence, famine, uh, whatever it is. When the world has a catastrophe and they dial 911, who is it that answers? It's the United States, isn't it, with the finest fighting military force the world has ever seen. We want to keep our country free. We have to be strong we have to not be ashamed of God. We have to live by his principles. We have to do things that matter. We have to lift up that name high, not be ashamed of it. We ought to have good legislators. We ought to have good police officers, and we do. Good first responders, and we do. And I can't tell you how thrilled I am that you all recognize that. You're having a family day. I do kind of question pastor's judgment for inviting me to speak. What was he thinking, right? So... I can't tell you how much I love you all and I appreciate being here today. And listen, God bless you all and God bless America.